For years I had wondered what the last day would be like. In January, after two decades in the top echelons of the British Security Service MI5, it was time to rejoin the real world. I emerged for the final time from Euston Road Tube Station. The winter sun shone brightly as I made my way down Gower Street toward Trafalgar Square. Fifty yards on, I turned into an unmarked entrance to an anonymous office block. Tucked between an arts college and a hospital stood the unlikely headquarters of British counter-espionage. I showed my pass to the policeman standing discreetly in the reception alcove and took one of the specially programmed lifts which carry senior officers to the sixth floor in a sanctum. I walked silently down the corridor to my room next to the Director General's suite. The offices were quiet. Far below, I could hear the rumble of tube trains carrying commuters to the West End. I unlocked my door. In front of me stood the essential tools of the intelligent officer's trade. A desk, two telephones, one scrambled for outside calls, and to one side a large green metal safe with an oversized combination lock on the front. I hung my coat up and began mechanically to arrange my affairs. Having seen too many retired officers at cocktail parties loitering for scraps of news and gossip, I wanted to make a clean break. I was determined to make a new life for myself breeding horses out in Australia. I turned the dials on the lock and swung open the heavy safe door. In front of me was a mass of registry files, stamped Top Secret, and behind them a neat stack of small combination boxes. Files, over the years I had drawn thousands. Now, these were the last. Routine agent reports circulated routinely to me. The latest reports of the computer working party, the latest analysis of provisional IRA strength. Files always need answers. I had none to give. The Russian diplomat's file had been sent to me by a younger officer. Did I recognise him? Not really. It was a double agent case which had been running off and on for years. Did I have any ideas? Not really. When you join the service, each case looks different. When you leave, they all seem the same. I carefully initialed off the files and arranged for my secretary to take them to the registry. After lunch, I set to work on the combination boxes, pulling them out from the back of the safe one by one. The first contained technical details of microphones and radio receivers, remnants of my time in the 1950s as MI5's first scientific officer. I arranged for the contents to be sent over to the technical department, an hour later, the head of the department came over to thank me. He was very much the modern government scientist, neat, cautious and constantly in search of money. Well, they were just odd things I kept, I said. I don't suppose you'll have any use for them. It's all satellites now, isn't it? Oh no, he replied. I'll enjoy reading them. He looked a little embarrassed. He and I had never really got on. We came from different worlds. I was a glue, sticks and rubber band improviser from the war. He was a defence contractor. We shook hands and I went back to sorting out my safe. The remaining boxes held papers gathered after I joined the counter-espionage department in 1964, when the search for spies in British intelligence was at its most intense. The handwritten notes and typed memoirs were packed with the universal currency of spying. Lists of suspects and details of accusations, betrayals and verdicts. Here, in the endless paper chase which began so clearly but ended in mystery, lay the threads of my career. Eventually, my secretary came in and handed me two blue books. Your diaries, she said, and together we shredded them into the burn bag beside my desk until it was time for the final ritual. I walked along to the establishment's office. The duty officer handed me a file containing a list of my current secret indoctrinations. I began to sign off the small sheets. Access to signals intelligence and satellite intelligence went first. Then I worked through the mass of case indoctrinations that I held. The acquisition of secrets is such a personal thing. The loss of them is painfully bucratic. Each stroke of the pen shut the door a little further. Within half an hour, the secret world which has sustained me for years was closed off forever. Toward dark, I took a taxi over to MI5's old headquarters at Leckenfield House in Mayfair. The organisation was in the process of moving to new offices at the top of Curzon Street, but the staff bar, the Pig and Eye Club, where my farewell party was due to be held, still remained in Leckenfield House. 
I went into the old building. Here, in the teak inlaid corridors and corniced offices, Philby, Burgess, McLean and Blunt were hunted down. And here too, we had fought MI5's most secret war over suspicions of an undiscovered mole at the heart of the service. Our suspect was the former Director General of MI5, Sir Roger Hollis, but we had never been able to prove it. Hollis's friends had bitterly resented the accusation, and for ten long years both sides had feuded like medieval foes, driven by instinct, passion and prejudice. One by one in the 1970s, the protagonists had retired, until finally the move to new offices signalled the end of the war. But walking the corridors of Leckenfield House, I could still feel the physical sense of treachery, of pursuit, and the scent of the kill. My party was a quiet affair. People said nice things. The Director General, Sir Michael Hanley, made a pretty speech and I received the customary cards with their handwritten farewell messages. Lord Clan Morris, the great MI5 agent runner, wrote that my departure was a sad, sad, irreplaceable loss. He meant to the office, but the real loss was mine. That night I slept in the flat on the top floor of the Gower Street offices, woken occasionally by the noise of trains arriving at Euston Station. Early the next morning I dressed, picked up my briefcase, empty for the first time, and walked down to the front door. I said goodbye to the policeman and stepped outside onto the street. My career was over. A sad, sad, irreplaceable loss. It all began in 1949, on the kind of spring day that reminds you of winter. The rain drummed against the tin roof of the prefabricated laboratory at Great Beddow in Essex, where I was working as a Navy scientist attached to the Marconi Company. An oscilloscope throbbed in front of me like a headache. Scattered across the trestle table was a mass of scribbled calculations. It was not easy designing a radar system, able to pick out a submarine periscope from amid the endless rolling wave clutter I'd been trying for years. The telephone rang. It was my father, Morris Wright, the Marconi engineering chief. Freddie Brundrant wants to see us, he said. That was nothing new. Brundrant had been chief of the Royal Naval Scientific Service and was now chief scientist of the Ministry of Defence. He had been taking a personal interest of late in the progress of the project. A decision was needed soon over whether to fund production of a prototype system. It would be expensive. Post-war defence research was an endless battle against financial attrition and I prepared myself for another ill-tempered skirmish. I welcomed the chance of talking to Brundrant direct. He was an old family friend. Both my father and I had worked for him in admiralty research during the war. Perhaps I thought there might be a chance of a new job. The following day we drove down to London in a steady drizzle and parked the car close to Brundrant's office in Storey's Gate. Whitehall looked grey and tired. The colonnades and statues seemed ill-suited to a rapidly changing world. We introduced ourselves to the neat secretary in Brundrant's outer office. The annex hummed in that subdued Whitehall way. We were not the first to arrive. I greeted a few familiar faces, scientists from various services laboratories, but it seemed a large turnout for a routine meeting, I thought. Two men who I had never met detached themselves from the huddle. You must be the right, said the shorter of the two abruptly. He spoke with a clipped military accent. My name is Colonel Malcolm Cunning from the War Office, and this is my colleague Hugh Winterbourne. Another stranger came over, and this is John Henry, one of our friends from the Foreign Office. Cunning employed the curious code Whitehall uses to distinguish its secret servants. Whatever the meeting was about, I thought, it was unlikely to concern anti-submarine warfare, not with a contingent from MI5 and MI6 present. Brundrant appeared at the door of his office and invited us in. His office, like his reputation, was vast. Giant sash windows and high ceilings completely dwarfed his desk. He showed us to the conference table, which had been carefully lined with ink blotters and decanters. Brundrant was a small, energetic man, one of that select band along with Lindman, Tizard and Cockcroft, responsible for gearing Britain for the technical and scientific demands of fighting World War II. As Assistant Director of Scientific Research for the Admiralty and later Deputy Director of the Royal Naval Scientific Service, 
he had been largely responsible for recruiting scientists into government service during the war. He was not especially gifted as a scientist, but he understood the vital role scientists could play. His policy was to promote youth wherever possible, and because the service chiefs trusted him, he was able to get the resources necessary to enable them to perform at their best. As a weary and diminished Britain girded herself to fight a new war in the late 1940s, the Cold War, Brundtrup was the obvious choice to advise on how best to galvanise the scientific community once again. He was appointed Deputy Scientific Advisor to the Ministry of Defence and succeeded Sir John Cockcroft as Scientific Advisor and Chairman of the Defence Research Policy Committee in 1954. Gentlemen, began Brundtrup when we were seated, it is quite clear to all of us, I think, that we are now in the midst of war and have been since events in Berlin last year. Brundtrup made it clear that the Russian blockade of Berlin and the Western airlift which followed had made a profound impact on defence thinking. This war is going to be fought with spies, not soldiers, at least in the short term, he went on. And I've been discussing where we stand with Sir Percy Silito, the Director General of Security Service. To be frank, he concluded, the situation is not good. Brundtrup crisply described the problem. It had become virtually impossible to run agents successfully behind the Iron Curtain, and there was a serious lack of intelligence about the intentions of the Soviet Union and her allies. Technical and scientific initiatives were needed to fill the gap. I have discussed the matter in outline with some of you here. Colonel Cumming from the Security Service and Peter Dixon representing MI6 and I have formed this committee to assess the options and initiate work at once. I've also suggested to Sir Percy that he obtain the services of a young scientist to help on the research side. I intend to submit the name of Peter Wright, whom some of you may know. He is currently attached to the Services Electronics Research Laboratory, and he will go over on a part-time basis until we find out how much work needs doing. Brundrant looked across at me. You'll do that for us, won't you, Peter? Before I could reply, he turned to my father. We'll obviously need help from Marconi, so I've co-opted you onto this committee as well. It was typical Brundtrup, issuing invitations as if they were orders and bending the Whitehall machine thoroughly out of shape to get his way. For the rest of the afternoon, we discussed ideas. The MI5 and MI6 contingents were conspicuously silent, and I assumed it was the natural reticence of the secret servant in the presence of outsiders. Each scientist gave a synopsis of any research in his laboratory which might possibly have an intelligence application. Obviously a full-scale technical review of intelligence services requirements would take time, but it was clear that they urgently needed new techniques of eavesdropping which did not require entry to premises. Soviet security was so tight that the possibility of gaining entry, other than through party walls or when an embassy was being rebuilt, was remote. By tea time, we had 20 suggestions of possible areas of fruitful research. Brundtrup instructed me to draw up a paper assessing them, and the meeting broke up. As I was leaving, a man from the post office technical department, John Taylor, who had talked at some length during the meeting about post office work on listening devices, introduced himself. We'll be working together on this, he said, as we exchanged telephone numbers. I'll be in touch next week. On the drive back to Great Baddow, Father and I discussed the meeting excitedly, It'd been so gloriously unpredictable in the way that Whitehall often was during the war, and had so seldom been since. I was thrilled at the opportunity to escape anti-submarine work, and so was my father, because it continued the thread of secret intelligence which had run through the family for four and a half decades. You've been listening to the book Spycatcher, written by Peter Wright. This book is available to purchase online at Amazon and other online book retailers.